Hello, friends. Welcome to the Show to Be Named Later podcast. I am your host, Johnny Voss, along with our good friend, a, a guy who had never been suspended from Columbia University, Noah Storzinger. How you doing? I'm I'm doing great, but I'm I'm already I'm throwing this out there already in case your your dad actually does watch this show. I'm already gonna apologize to Steve because this one's gonna go a little longer than usual, and it it, it just has to be that way because. We haven't been rocking, you know, two weeks, uh, and and we I think we missed a lot out on uh, the Twins' first month, and now we've got Timberwolves playoffs coming up, um, and there's just a lot of a lot of things that need to be covered. So, you know, sorry, I guess you can always always click it off if you, if you want, but um, I'm I'm ready to go right now. What you All got? Right? All right. Well, the first thing that I want to do is. Uh, because it's it's going to get a little blue uh, after that, and I'm not talking about you know Timberwolves blue. Um, I we'll we'll get to this. All right, uh, I did want to congratulate the Minnesota Timberwolves, um, second best regular season record of all time for this franchise, 56 and 26, uh, but at what cost? Okay, and now I understand that it is, and and I I mean that sincerely. I the Wolves had a great season. There's there's no question about that at all. Um, so so I mean that is a sincere congratulations to you guys. It it was a great a great regular season. You'd agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean it was like you said, second best uh, in franchise history, and the best team I've ever ever watched in my lifetime. So right. Okay, so now I know that Festivus is over, uh, but now is uh, the portion of the show. This is what we call the airing of grievances because I got a lot of problems with a lot of you people out there, and 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 we're just going to get to it right 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 off the bat because with the Timberwolves, uh, with the Timberwolves having the the, the second best all time. Uh, regular season record of, of all time. They ended up with the third spot in the playoffs and uh, really the, the toughest road to the NBA finals, in my opinion, uh, as far as if you wanted to put all the pieces, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen um, in these series, but they, they draw the, the Phoenix Suns in the, in the first round. And, and th- this is where I'm going to start with the problems that I have because with such a great year that the Wolves had, it's almost like when it was announced that we have the Phoenix Suns, it was like fans, media, people that know basketball, people that don't know, were already making their concession speeches and saying it was a great year, but we're done now. It's that we don't have a chance against the Phoenix Suns. Myself, somewhat included in that, and this is based on three games that we played with um, the Phoenix Suns this year, and we will break all of that down right now. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not ready to throw the towel in. I'm not ready to put the white flag up and say, we can't do – we were the third best fucking team and should have been the, the number one team in the Western Conference. We only missed the number one or number two seed by one game. Okay, so I'm not ready to throw out everything and say this is a absolute no chance, no win situation for the Minnesota Timberwolves. However, well, I can I can get to my prediction in a little bit. What do you think about what I'm what I'm opening up with? Well, to your to your point, I was frustrated about the fans and and the reaction. And it's I mean, it's not to say when I when I found out we were the three seed, you know, it's like okay, you get the Suns. Immediate reaction was ah shit. You know yep. what I mean? Like it yep. was all right. I mean, you haven't beat the beat that team yet this year, uh, but what a perfect time to do it right in the playoffs. Um, but it it is frustrating, I think, to draw them. Um, but I I'm not at, definitely not ready to throw in the towel yet. I mean, regular season is far different from playoffs, um, and I think you're going to see a lot different uh, a lot different players. I think uh, in the playoffs compared to the regular season. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that's where we need to set it because if, if folks don't know, if, if you don't watch 82 games um, out of the year, or at least three games with a team from Arizona, um, like nerds like us do, um, the reason this being is because the Suns have not only beat us 
the three times we've seen them, they've absolutely spanked us every single time. Um, I believe that all, out of all three games, we were no closer than 10 points by halftime at every every point of the game. And, and I think, uh, what was it, like 51 or 52 points was the total out of all three games, how much we lost the total three games, right? Um, that, yeah. At least two of the games were 25, 20 to 25 point at best, right, at the end of the game. And there was nothing – and it, in fact, we played them the last game of the year, and there was nothing about that game that said the Wolves are ready for this team, okay? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at – okay, I mean, those three games, yes, it wasn't – it absolutely wasn't pretty. Um, first game – and I'm not here to make excuses – but I'm at least trying to show that that there was some um, obstacles in our way for these three games where that first game, I mean, second half of back-to-back, road back-to-back, right after Golden State, that one was tough. Um, second game, I think you didn't have Cat. Um, I, I can't remember if there was one other person was hurt. Um, the third game was, I think, sec- Cat's second game back, so he really just – I didn't get to watch it, but I, I don't oh, think he looked very you. sharp. And um, that one, that one concerns me. The first two games, we we also still that that second game we held Phoenix like under, yeah, under a hundred. Yeah. And now we only scored like eighty two, but at the same time the defense was still working without Cat as well. So um, definitely some some tough games to watch, and definitely the toughest matchup. I still think I'd rather have Phoenix over. The Pelicans, just because of the well, Pelicans. I can hardly wait to talk about that team, but but that's but, well, well down the road. Um, but you know they, they're going to have to adjust. Like they're absolutely going to have to adjust. Um, the way they're going to defend Anthony Edwards is going to be um, they're either they're going to come out completely different or run it the same way they did. Um, I don't think they probably go the same defend him the same way they did in the regular season. Oh, absolutely, you would. Let, let's get into that right now because the, the problem there's there. We could spend a half hour just on Anthony Edwards alone. Anthony Edwards averaged 14 points a game in uh, three matchups with the Phoenix Suns this year, and here is let, let's just get into it right now because I'm already con, there. There's some things that concern me about. Um, this, you know, everyone says that the reason everyone is freaking out about the Phoenix Suns is because um, it's it's just a bad matchup, and there there are things like that in the NBA where you just don't match up well with a team. Um, but here is what what really worries me about this upcoming series. Anthony Edwards only averaged fourteen points a game, and here is the problem. In all three of those games, the Suns did not allow any driving range uh, lanes at all. None. And and that frustrated him because Edwards' jumper is hit or miss. And right now, or at least against the Suns, it was it was mostly miss. If he cannot get to the basket, that's that's one thing that's going to frustrate him and is going to take away from the Wolves being successful in this in this uh uh, matchup in the series. Now, if Edwards can't find a way to score, he's still going to try. And and here is what I am extremely concerned about with Anthony Edwards. The playoffs are called differently than the regular season games by the referees. They let him play just a little bit more, right? And what did Bradley Beal say after game number three? He said, just We're going to beat the hell out of him. Absolutely. And then, which you could see, I, well, you didn't watch the, the third game, but Edwards was getting very, very frustrated with the lack of calls and the fact that he was getting the hell beat out of him. And he started to focus more on the referees than what his responsibility was on the floor. And here's the thing. If he can't score, if he thinks he's getting fouled because he is, and he's getting the shit kicked out of him, I believe, and this is prediction number one, that Edwards is going to lose his shit during one of these games and is going to get ejected and maybe suspended. That That's one prediction. And, gee, I hope I'm wrong, but 
you mark my words on this, man. They are going to play such physical basketball, and it's not going to be an easy uh, knife through butter to the lane. And Edwards is going to lose his shit in this series. I, I guarantee it. Do you think with the pressure and the focus they put on Anthony Edwards, it opens the door for Carl Anthony Towns to be the MVP of this series? You, you would think, but is Edwards going to be mature or smart enough to try to find, because he's getting double teamed and it's, I mean, it's, it's, everyone knows it's coming. So, you know, you talk about coaching and going, okay, we're going to have to find a way to beat that. The Edwards is going to have to be a part of beating that and being able to find the open man because they, they swarm as soon as he gets the ball, he's swarmed by two players which obviously means that there's someone open. But if that's not your forte, if that's not your game, because you think that you can drive to the lane with the head down, dribbling through two guys, and then that's when it's off his knee or he just turns the ball over, that's going to be a problem. Now, if he is able to get it, yeah, Towns offensively, I like this just because the Wolves are bigger than the Phoenix Suns. And, and everyone's figuring out how are they going to do this with uh, a bigger lineup and Phoenix plays smaller. Are they going to be able to keep up and blah, blah, blah. But you're right. Offensively, Towns should be able to pick up the slack. However, defensively, I am very concerned about Carl Anthony Towns on the defensive side of the board. I think it opens up some stuff for Nas, though, too, because I think Nas can – because you look at when you play small, I mean, Rudy's tra traditionally going to struggle – um, and I could see some big Nas Reed minutes now, um, with Anthony Edwards. I mean, the, the only reason I brought that up was because he had mentioned that, you know, he said, if we win this series, Cat should probably be the MVP of that series only because he knows how they're going to defend him. And it just opens up the lanes uh, and the opportunities for Cat. Now to your point, he's got to get it to him. Um, and, and that's, and that's the big thing. Now, another thing I think we, we, we tend to, forget about the playoffs is luckily we weren't in the play in this year. Um, and when you played the Phoenix suns, you had what one, maybe two days to prepare uh, to, to play against the Phoenix suns. You've seen them three times. Yes. They've kicked your ass, but now you had about a week and a half to really prepare that, for everything. That's a that, they threw you. That, that, that is a very good point. Um, now, <laughs> It, it was interesting because I, I listened to Michael Nury, the assistant coach, which I, he's awesome. He is, so, he is so cool. However, he said something yesterday. I think it was on uh, Dan Barrero's show, which I'm not buying. He said at the end of his interview, he said, well, we kind of knew on Sunday that Phoenix was going to be the team that we were going to get in the playoffs. So we didn't show them everything. Um, that they're going to see in the playoffs in in the series um, that there there are some kind of like hidden agenda. And I'm sorry, man, I that that ain't flying with me. Like that that you didn't, and, and that's in three straight games that you got your ass kicked by not a very good team. The Phoenix Suns are not a great ball club, and that's what makes this even worse for me to hear everyone just going, "Well, it's over." You know, it's going to be it's it's going to be done in four or five games which that's my second prediction. I did say the Suns in five games. And really? I, I did. And the problem I have with this is that, like I say, Phoenix is not a great team. They lost to the Spurs without Victor not too long ago. They lost to Memphis. Okay. I just heard their beat reporter on a local radio station, Phoenix Sun beat reporter, who was talking about the Suns the way that maybe we're talking about the Wolves, like he was like talking about the most frustrating team uh, to, to watch, that they are so bad and so inconsistent, and yet he still picked the Suns in six games. I I, I have Wolves in seven, um, but it's going to take every ounce of grit that this team has, I think, to win this game or win, the, win this series. Um Yes, you should have. I, I think that they're frustrated because when you have a team of Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, and Kevin Durant, you should probably be a better ball club. Um, 
But Bradley no, Beal, Bradley Beal is not the same player though, and, and he's been hurt a lot of the year. But he isn't the same same yeah. kind of player, except when he plays the Wolves. Then he can't miss. Right, and but but to the Wolves' point of everyone thinks it's over, I, you know that's just a Minnesota thing. I I think it would have been the same thing if oh we drew uh, the Pelicans or we drew the Lakers. Um, it would have been. I think Phoenix had a little more than any any of the teams. Maybe New Orleans, but. Not after what I saw the other night, but we'll get to that, like I say, in a, in a little bit. But, um, you know, if you want to talk, Phoenix, like we have a better bench than they do. But here's the thing. If you can't ever get to their bench in in relevant minutes because you're down by 30 fucking points and, and you can't ever get a, a chance to uh, – to at least explore our bench versus their bench because in three games it hadn't been that way. Like I say, Bradley Beal has not been great all year. Against us, he's great. Uh, Durant doesn't seem to be able to miss, and I, you know how I feel about Kevin Durant, okay? Um, Devin Booker is always going to kill the Wolves. He has his entire career. He's supposed to be a Wolf because he and Carl Anthony Towns are such good friends, but it just never uh, came came to light. Um, but here's, here's to me, the X factor in this series. And maybe, maybe it was a fluke, but I don't think so. I mean, they rewarded him with a pretty big contract, Grayson Allen. And who do you put on Grayson Allen? Carl Anthony Towns? He had 20 points. In, and that's the difference between – this team and the Wolves, when you have an open shooter like Grayson Allen, going to nail it every time he shoots it, if he's open. Where the Wolves is like 50-50. You know, the Jane McDaniel in the corner, you never know if it's going in or not. So that that is, I guess, some of the, uh, the, the worry that we as Wolves fans have is that they've got – three pretty strong guys and then they've got a fourth that can can score points as well and and right now we don't i believe it was rudy and mike conley let us in scoring the last game that we played that can't happen folks it just can't happen so who who um i'm assuming ant would probably take booker i would with, imagine with jaden taking KD. Yep. Um, and here's what I've been hearing. People have been calling for, for not to start over Mike Conley because Beal is a little too strong for, for Mike Conley. Right. I don't, I don't agree with that, that call either. So, well, cause I, I at first I was saying, do you have Conley guard Allen? But then you'd have Cat on Beal, and that wouldn't. No, that wouldn't work. no, I don't think you, you can do that. So I no. mean, I think I I listened to Sam Sam Mitchell talk a few days ago, and what he said is exactly the case. Is is that he said number one, and he sounds stupid, but you got to make shots because if you make a shot, that means they got to inbound the ball you know, and, and, and begin their offensive scheme on missed shots. If Phoenix is able to get going in the transition, whether it's turnovers, stupid turnovers that we give up for no reason, or it's off missed shots. And we have to be able to somehow maintain the Suns to half court so that they're not constantly running. If that happens, we're fucked. I'm sorry. We are. Well, yeah, that was always the that was always the fear. If you drew Sacramento because they just ran, 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 um, it, it's the reason why we're the number one defense is a half court defense in the half court because um, we we are terrible transition defense. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean to your point, like if if they're hitting shots in transition, like you're gonna have to make shot after shot after shot um, just to keep up because if you get behind and they keep running too, um, then yeah, it's over. So. It'll be interesting. I think that I uh, I heard Mike Conley talking to his teammates that there's a little bit of um, I don't want to say desperation. I can't remember the word he used, but he's like, "I'm I'm getting there," you know. No, like, I, I I know exactly what you're talking about, and he, he was trying to motivate his team. And this, this is the problem I have with this. He said, "You guys are going to have a number of chances 
to play in the playoffs again, like have a shot at what we think. He said, I've got one, maybe two years left. So if you're not going to do it, do it for me. Okay. But to me, you can't have motivation. Like you already should be fucking motivated to be, you're the second best team in the franchise history. You don't need gray and old Mr. Connolly telling you, Hey, let's do it for the, the old guy. You should already have that motivation going into it. You have two home games to open this series up. All right. And, and so I, I don't, I don't think that you need a, an old guy saying, I, I really need this for, for me and my career because I'm not going to get this shot anymore as those young guys. And some of those guys, this is like Jade McDaniels. He doesn't have any experience in the playoffs, right? Like this should be his time. Well, he's got the Grizzlies series. Yes, but okay. A winning playoff series. Then I'll give you that. Okay. But that's, that's my, my, my question is who do you really think is going to show up on Saturday? Because the Wolves had 19 turnovers in the first half in their last game against Phoenix. And it wasn't because they were playing this crazy uh, cameo, uh, wave your hands in the air like you just don't care, defense. It was us just turn it. Here's the ball. Perhaps you'd like it. Okay. And is that going to be the team that, that shows up to, uh, on Saturday? Is it, are, are we going to have all these unforced turnovers that make us look absolutely ridiculous, or are we going to come with the intensity that we need to come with in game one? And that that's when I say playoff basketball is different because you think about guys like Nikhil, um, Nas Reed, guy, guys like that, that last year, now uh, Nas didn't play in the, the playoffs last year, but um, I really think about a Nikhil Alexander Walker last year in the playoffs really, really, really showed out. I mean, really showed out. That's a big reason why he got that contract. Um, the lights are different in the playoffs. And I think really for a lot of those guys, I mean, you hear it, they don't really care about the regular season. They care about the playoffs. And that's why I just think this team's going to going to jump even further, especially a guy like Nikhil. I think Nas is going to, is going to play to those, those heights. I think Ant's going to be a little different. Um, I, I, who are your top three? Who who are the the top three performers in this series for the Wolves? You think it's it's, it's got to be? I I don't care about clogging the lanes or anything. Edwards all the way across the board. If he if he's held the fourteen pointer, he had seven shots against the Suns in one of the three games that they played. If he is completely taken out of the series, bye bye. Okay, so he's got to be number one. Um. I think Rudy Gobert defensively and with a little help on the offensive side as well, whether that's offensive rebounding or the lob pass to him, I think he has got to make his presence known in this one. Somehow, it's somehow got to be, okay? And then I would say, you know, I I, I, I don't know. The, the third one, I would go back and forth. I mean, there, there are three guys – that, that should be able to step up. And if that's the case, then it should be five guys. It shouldn't be just set at three. I think Nas Reed has to be the Nas Reed that we've seen so many times this year. If he's a non-factor, bye-bye as well. I think Carl Anthony Towns, whether we don't know what we're going to get with him, but you know, some are saying that this is kind of his swan song as a Minnesota Timberwolf. You know, I hear Golden State is the one that's going to going to try to lure him away or whatever it is. Towns is going to have to show that he, I mean that his time is now. So I think that he's a wild card for the third one. Here's the real wild card. I mean, the Wolves are going to do anything in this series. Jaden McDaniel. All the way across the board, defensively and offensively. If Jaden McDaniel actually, if he's half the player that we thought he was going to be when he signed that fucking contract, then I think the Wolves are in a really, really good spot. If he can give you 10 a night yep. with a steal and a block a night, I mean, that changes the game. It absolutely changes the game. Um, I mean, what three would you go with? So Ant, Ant and Rudy were my top two. Um 
my third, and it goes between two guys, is I really think Nikhil can can change a series a bit just with his defense and some of his shot making because he's a real 3 and D guy yep. now. But my other one was Mike Conley because okay. if, if someone's going to move the ball, it's Mike. If someone's going to have to make some clutch threes, it's going to have to be Mike because – if you if you're leaving guys open, I mean, I think they leave Jaden open more than they would leave right. Mike open. But Mike always seems to have a corner somewhere, and if well, he's not going to knock down shots, it's going to be tough. And isn't that the deal that if he makes three three pointers in a game, the Wolves usually win, right? It's not yeah, Waller's right. law, but it's uh, Conley's law, I guess. So, yeah. um, okay. Uh, now I did say because, I mean, shoot, man, like like I say, like friends, coworkers. Most of the people that I talk about, the Wolves, are, are saying it, it's done. We'll see you next year. Um, the one that I was surprised because my friends usually give me a hard time about being overly negative and not giving us even a chance going into a, into a game, usually the playoffs. Um, but I, you know, I, I did start the show by congratulating them. But one of my good friends, probably the guy that I watched the most sports with, um, I, I – texted him i think it was last night and uh about watching the game and uh he texted back i'm worried about this one th this series and i was like usually it's me that you know throws those things out there i said the wolves in five and he said yep and that's usually un or i should say unusual for the the friend that i'm talking about because he's usually not all gloom and doom right off the bat um this is what i think is going to happen and I, I could be wrong, and I, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Uh, but we're going to talk Twins baseball here in a minute. And so I think that the Wolves take one of two in Minneapolis, and then the Suns run the table from there on out. Uh, and and it will be the Suns in, in five. My question to you is, if the Wolves lose on Saturday, they lose the first game, would you not think that that pretty much would be the series? If they if they lose on Saturday, meaning they have to win game two, which you don't know, but I could just see the win being taken out of their sails completely if they end up losing game one. Um, I'm going to say no only because, I, I mean, they stole game one two years ago in Memphis. And, and couldn't couldn't finish that series. Right, and right. Um, I, I think if they start 0-2, you can kiss the series goodbye. Well, yeah, obviously. If, yes. if you lose two right away, you're done. Um, and if you come back, great, that's a miracle, honestly. But, um, I, I I mean, if they start 2-0, and you can absolutely I, – like, I think that's a series win. 1-1, um, one and one, I think, is is different. I think if you, st if you take game one – great and you lose game two fine but if you lose game one and take game two then i think it'll look a little different you know what i mean maybe i i just i just think that if they lose game one i think you can you can you can kiss it goodbye and, and here's the deal i'm not saying that that we as minnesota fans have to be okay with this. We should be pounding the table right now and saying, look, this is the second best team we've ever put on the floor ever. And so I'm not happy with conceding or just going, well, oh, they're too good for us. I can't, we can't do anything about it. We got, you have to find a way to beat this team because here's the thing. It wouldn't have mattered. You're going to get a hard team to play no matter what in the playoffs. It's just how it works. And yeah, you would have you would have preferred, but you know it's different than twenty years ago when the Wolves were the number one seed. They got the number eight seed Denver Nuggets, and you knew the Nuggets weren't going to give you any any problems. Okay, there was only one number eight that beat a number one in my lifetime up until a few years ago, and that was the Denver Nuggets beating the Seattle SuperSonics with Dikembe Mutombo. But that just didn't happen. If you were a number one seed, you were pretty much. Uh, you were pretty much guaranteed that you were going to the second round. Now, my point is about Wolves fans and us in general is that you don't have to be okay with this. The, 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 the Wolves were to lose in four games or five games. Fuck off. 
We should be pounding the table and saying, we're not okay with this. We had such a good team this year that there should be no reason why we should even be thinking we're going to get, we're going to get blown out here. Right? Absolutely. Um, I, I think, I think this is the hardest matchup this team will face in the playoffs. I think if you beat the Phoenix Suns, you have a trip to the finals, personally. Like that that's my prediction is I think if you can find a way to beat this team, you are gonna you are gonna beat the rest of the teams. Well, and, and just think about that is that you know, I said it's it's the hardest road that they're gonna that they're gonna have to tow here. Is it because you've got potentially a Denver matchup in the second round, and then after that, of course, whoever OKC or whomever, Dallas, whatever, um, a little more difficult than, than, than others. But um, man, I'm, I'm just not ready to, 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 to sell it here yet. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I want to believe that we should be the team that, you know, and the only guy that I heard that gave the Wolves a chance was Brian Scalabrini on his, his show. And he was like all the way across the board, Boom, boom, boom. It's going to be the Wolves. It's going to be the Wolves. And I'm like, wait, what? Now, that was at the beginning of the week. By yesterday, he still picked the Wolves, but he goes, I'm not okay with it. I don't – I'm not feeling it again. And so, um, I'm just saying, man, like, I, I'm going to I'm gonna support this team no matter what. But, um, man, I just and, – and here's the last part that I got to talk about with, with the Wolves heading in. They got a 2.30 game tomorrow. When do the Wolves ever come out in an afternoon? And they're usually Sunday games, right, 2.30, and they never come out ready to play at 2.30 in the fucking afternoon on a weekend. Yeah, Anthony Edwards typically is horrible 2.30 games. Well, let's games hope he can even find the court by 2.30 <laughs> tomorrow. But Yeah. Um, now, do you think – well, I'll ask you that. Okay. Two questions then. Yep. If they win game one, how does that change the outlook on the series? I guess it would depend on what they what their game plan is going because they're going to have to change some things up tomorrow for sure uh, because nothing has worked uh, as far as – so if that means finding a way to get Edwards involved even though he's going to get the hell beat out of them or – suddenly Carl Anthony Towns is a huge piece in the puzzle, or we just clamp down and don't allow Phoenix to scratch. I mean, it's going to depend on what team shows up and, and what their game, but, and Michael Nury said, Hey, they haven't seen everything we've done. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's really going to matter on who shows up tomorrow. Don't you think? Well, yeah. And I, but I, I think the, the, part where everyone is freaking out is because this team did not beat the Phoenix Suns in the regular season. I, I think that not even close. No, well, right. Right. But I think if you, if the fans, if fans can see a win, I think it would completely flip everyone. Oh, wait, we actually can beat them. We were the three seed. Yep. We're actually really good. We got this because I think it would have been completely different. If even if we got spanked, two out of three times and we won the other game. I think it would have been different. But why why should we as the number three seed go, oh wait, we can actually, we actually can you know what I mean? We should be the ones that are going, we're gonna fucking punch you in the mouth and you're gonna yeah. want to wish for the season to be over, right? I mm. well 19 turnovers in the first half ain't gonna cut it. We we all know okay. that. But here is an X factor for game one and game two. I honestly believe that target center is going to be on fire, right? It, and, Dude, and, and, and as far as six man going, you know, I hate that with Seattle's got the 12th man and blah, blah, blah. But the target center has been rocking all year and that can be a momentum swinger or it can be a game changer. Don't you think? Absolutely. I, I mean, Chris Finch put it, he likes the late games because everyone's kind of had some, uh, the the drinks are flowing a little bit, which I thought was funny. Yep. This one's at 2.30, so, you know, we'll, we'll need to get the day drinkers in there. But, um, 
it, it well, was. We got the twins later on, so let's just drink all day and all night. Right? Yeah, right. Um, the <laughs> it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes because Target Center has been, I think, one of the hardest places to play this year, and and it's fun to hear other players say that because I mean, I think we had talked about it months ago of just how dead Target Center used to be, and now it is. Yep. Yep. Just been on fire. Um, and now that it's the playoffs, I mean, I, I, I've been to a couple of those playoff games, um, you know, with, with, with the Rockets. And uh, actually, I didn't get to go to the Grizzlies one. But um, even when we were the eight seed playing the Rockets, that place was on fire. Right. This has been – this is a whole nother level. So um, let, me, let me ask you a question based on that because I did – had this conversation. I don't, I don't know if he, he understood what I was saying, but I, I had a conversation with a coworker. I said, cause I was actually pretty excited about the play in games. Um, the other night and you had the Lakers and the, and the Pelicans, and then you had golden state and uh, Sacramento and both games. I was very excited to watch until the next night. I was like in, in Philly, the, the Philly matchup wasn't a bad matchup, but I just don't, have the same energy or excitement and don't see that when I watch the Eastern conference, is that just because I'm being biased and be, because why is it that the Western conference excites me a little bit more? Is it the players? Is it the atmosphere? What is it? Because I'm just not interested in Eastern conference basketball. I'm not. Well, no, and it's just, it's, it's frankly, it's not as good. Um, and it really has, hasn't been, for a long time. I mean, when was the last time the East was considered better than the West? Right. So, you know, I think that's got to be just longevity of knowing, hey, you, 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 you play in the West. Like you, you teams are in the West. That that's kind of the thing because yeah, the East, like, and I've heard even with the expansion draft, if they are the expansions, if they do that, Minnesota move to the East. Great. We are going to roll. Yeah, right. in the East, man. Like, the what like the Bulls had like thirty nine wins and are potentially going to be in the playoffs here. Right. I mean that that's the thing, right? Well, and and when I watch it, and they were talking about it, it was the Philly game. Um, oh, you can you can cut the tension with a with a knife, and it and it just doesn't sound. No, I'm not saying that Philly fans aren't loud and and obnoxious and and you know, but it it just didn't seem like the same energy that you saw. You know, and I've been to games in New Orleans, and that's not necessarily the biggest basketball town around. But those games seemed like there was a little bit more going on than the Eastern Conference. And, you know, obviously Boston is is going to be on fire, you know, when, when they take the floor. But, um, okay, something I did not understand. I mean, I understand it because uh, I tell you with a grain of salt from who was talking, but I happened to catch uh, yesterday – uh, cause I try not to watch Stephen A. Smith. Um, but I watched he and, uh, I think it's Tim Legler was on and they started talking because it was the, the day after the Lakers won, they beat new Orleans. Um, and both guys said, if the Lakers, if they get by and get in if they can beat Denver, they are going to win the NBA championship. Both of them said it. And I'm like, now, wait a minute. You guys beat New Orleans by four points and should not, and we'll get to Zion, like I say, briefly. But you only beat them by four points, and they're already saying, if you get by Denver, well, that's a pretty big if, motherfucker, don't you think? And and said, if they beat Denver, it's it's a done deal. They're the NBA champions for 2024. Are you kidding me? Come on. I think the, the only thing is they're they're rolling right now. I mean, they're knocking off wins. But there was a – I don't know the full stat, but in LeBron's entire playoff career, he has only lost one first-round matchup. Only one. Yeah, but you got to understand. And that was 2021. 20, that's fine, but I'm I'm sorry, man. Like, it's not the same as last year. But Denver swept them last year, and Denver is still and 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 I'm telling you, the Lakers should not have won on Tuesday night. They shouldn't have. 
Okay. And, and so that's, I guess why I was appalled that they were saying, if you get by Denver and boy, and Stephen A. Smith, like, it doesn't matter who you're going to get outside at, after Denver, they're going to go. He didn't even bring up the wolves. He talked about Dallas. He talked about Oklahoma city. He, uh, he talked about uh, the Clippers never even mentioned the wolves, but said, it doesn't matter if you get by Denver, it's a done deal. Disagree. Wholeheartedly. I mean, it's the same way where I said, if you get by Phoenix, I think you're going to the finals. But because I mean, if the Lakers can beat Denver, like, like you said, Denver is so, so, so good. And if the Lakers somehow find a way to beat them, that's scary. Like right. that is right. because okay. if we win, if we win, we're going to have to play them. Okay. You know, well, we play that winner. Right. I, I understand that. It, it, I, I just don't think that the Lakers, I, you know what? I mean, buy me a hamburger at uh, Lions tap. If, if the Lakers actually go more than five games with Denver, because I don't think it's going to happen. I also just don't I like hatefully because I just, I, I don't want to see D'Lo go far in any playoffs. No, no. Just, and he's actually playing pretty good. Back up. But he's still going to not play defense, and that's my point. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but I agree. D'Lo is – well, wait. You can't call him D'Lo, though, remember? Because there's no D in that guy's person at all. So, yeah, all right. So that brings me to my last point uh, for NBA. Uh, I have been hard on Zion Williamson uh, for a couple years now because – the Pillsbury Doughboy is soft, and I've been saying that for a long time, man. And when he says things like, well, I could have played, but I wouldn't have been a uh, Zion, so I don't, you know, I can't play hurt or whatever it is. Okay. Tuesday night, I watched that game against the Lakers, and I was like, wait a minute, why am I like the first half? I was like, why am I worried about New Orleans Pelicans? Why? And then I don't know if you saw the game, Noah, but Zion was a stud, right? I was like, this guy, they could not stop him. He was, and I was like, wow, that dude is balling. Until three minutes left in the game, he makes his shot and immediately runs off the court, okay? Now, I heard after the game that he did not have a leg brace on and he wasn't limping, okay? Regardless, it doesn't matter because he's already been ruled out for their next game, right? Right? But here's the thing. If I if my name was Zion Williamson and I had 40 points and had the best fucking game of my NBA career, you would have had to bring me out of that game in shackles. You would have had to tase me to get me out of that game. Okay, and obviously he's never heard of guys like, um, oh, I don't know, Bernard King or Willis Reed or Isaiah Thomas who would go, you know what? I'm not going to allow you. I will play on one leg. Doesn't matter. Okay. And to me, this is just another example of wasted fucking youth. So, because absolutely, yes. But I don't think it was his decision to come out. It sure was. Oh, he immediately, he started, started, and then, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just, because I saw that. But I had I had taken from it as because he came out with leg soreness, like yes, and that's through. still what the injury is. But He's going to miss their next game because of leg soreness. But to me, like, and and maybe I'm wrong too, and maybe, but I I had thought that the coaching staff said no, you're not like because you, they had another game, so they didn't they figured they could they didn't want him to injure it more or whatever. That's what I got from it. But maybe I'm wrong because. Yeah, he had like 40, 11, and he five was or something. Stoppable. And it to me, and it looked like and and for for me to watch that, and you know, we I I've tried to tell you about, you know, guys like Kevin McHale sharpening their elbows and these Pistons Celtics matchups where they were punching each other in the face, okay? And they're still being allowed to play the next night. There is a different degree of level of toughness and what you owe your team. I think, and like I say, if I was Zion Williamson, you would have basically had to knock me out to get me out of that game. And if that was a coaching decision, then you better motherfucking knock me out 
cold and, and wheel me out of that arena because he had that team on his back and he walked away and he walked away. And it, I'm sorry, man. I, no I, respect. I, I, I was starting to go, Oh, maybe I was wrong about Z. Not anymore, man. No respect for that fucker. No way. When I, I, I truly think like, especially if it was his decision, um, and they lose their next game too. And they're not in the playoffs. Cause they had a good year. Like, yeah. I mean, every team in the West had a good year almost. Um, I, if I'm, if I'm the Pelicans fan base, I trade them. Well, but that's, here's the thing. Ooh, I mean, and, and that, that was even worse for them to watch Anthony Davis do what he did ag against them and then to lose by that. But, you know, everyone's going to leave. That's the only thing in New Orleans that you're hanging your hat on. But what I'm saying is, do you want the, the, the big Keebler elf to be the face of your franchise? Because to me, he's soft, round, and he's not like Barkley. You know, he, the round mound of rebound. He Barkley in a tough, and he even said that. I would not have left that game. Well, no, and, and but but and I here's the thing: I don't even think Zion to like when I think of the Pelicans, I don't even think of Zion. I think of Brandon Ingram, right? Every time, every time. So like, I, I don't know. And Zion's barely healthy. He, he when he does play, he's either going to give you a great game or a shitty game, right? Um, trade him. It, it just feels like an Anthony or a Andrew Wiggins situation, right. where it's just kind of there's no fight and he'll give you give you some here but not there and right just cut the cord and i love that i think i bring that up you know they're talking that carl anthony towns is supposedly very coveted in golden state wouldn't you love to see a wiggins towns reunion just so you could laugh and make fun of him but i think <laughs> i think if <laughs> that's our got, guy that we're talking about so but if you fun. got if if you traded cat to golden state who you got to get Wiggins back contract wise, right? Unless you're trading us Steph Curry or Clay Thompson, I don't know. But well, then that's the big the you know that's everyone's wondering what they're going to do with Clay Thompson if he's going to like. And Seth already, I think said or Steph already said, there's no way I want to play without this guy uh, next year or whatever. But he was terrible. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was. He was. And Stephen A. Smith said he's a no doubter Hall of Famer. You believe that, Clay Thompson? Yeah. Okay. Four championships. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All uh, right. Anything else NBA wise? Oh, did you give us a prediction? You said the said Wolves, Wolves is six, seven, seven. Okay. Seven. All right. Anything else? You got any big plans for the for game one? Uh, no, I'm going to be working, so I'll be listening to the game. I know because it's okay. a two thirty game, unfortunately. Now, will but. you go back and it, regardless of the outcome, will you go back and watch it? Uh, the, the telecast, if, if you have to listen to it on the radio, I typically don't, if we lose, I won't go back and watch the game just cause I'm pissed off, but it's playoff ball. So I'm going to watch it. Okay. I'll go back and watch even if we lose. All right. Now we are going to shift to baseball. And I did say that this is the airing of grievances. I know it's just been a month, Noah, but, uh, this is what I want to touch upon with the Minnesota twins. Um, because they are not a good baseball team right now. And like you say, it's only been a month. But there were some predictions that were made in the offseason and in spring training right up to opening day um, that I want to cover because, you know, we talked about levels with the Timberwolves, but there are a lot of levels to the Minnesota Twins right now. And I think the first thing that we have to cover is the starting rotation. Um, I had said earlier in, in many podcasts that you have not filled the positions that were vacated by Sonny Gray and Kenta Maeda. Now I'm not saying that Sonny Gray for the money was, but I mean, if you're not spending money, shoot, he looked great right now. Um, I don't know if Kenta Maeda either, however, he ain't given up eight runs uh, every start either. And what I was concerned about going into the season was uh, I wanted Louis Varland out of the bullpen more than I wanted him to be a starter, okay? Uh, because his 
the way he approaches batters is completely different out of the bullpen. That's when he's got the fire and he's got the zip to his, his fastballs uh, and his cutters. And you're not seeing that right now. And he, he was unproven going into this year to make him uh, one of, one of your, your, your rotation guys. Um, the other one I didn't understand. We talk about, Unproven. You didn't know what you had going into the season. Varlin was one of them, and we see what he's done. I mean, he hasn't had one good outing. And, right, it's one month. I know that. But that means, is it going to be the rotation between Minneapolis and St. Paul again? That was one of the concerns I had. Then the other one, the sheriff. Self, first of all, who? what is that self-proclaimed? How is he the sheriff? What, what is he, the sheriff of Rock Ridge? And who appointed him the sheriff? Was it the Honorable J.P. LaPetamane? Because I have no idea why Chris Paddock, who was, yeah, he came off the injury and he looked good, you know, when he get, got back last year going to the playoffs. But you put him into the starting rotation not knowing what you were getting with him. So that was two of the five guys in the starting rotation that you went, this is who, who we're going with, unproven. Okay, Bailey Ober has not looked good either in any start this year. And let's say, man, I, every day I go, I say to this guy, happy Pablo day. Pablo has not, not looked great this year. His last start was probably the best outing that he had, except he gave up the leadoff home run, which, and then shut the door. But, oh, by the way, the Wolves can't, or I'm sorry, the Twins can't score any runs. So that was already like a 5-0 game in my mind on the first batter, okay? And so I, I'm very, very concerned. Final thing, the law firm came in and gave us a great outing, Simeon Woods Richardson, right? You get that reference, the law firm. and But – what I'm concerned about is that you are now going to have an automatic rotation between who your number five guy is. And it's not like, yeah, we should have, you know, got a few more. His We're getting guys that are giving up eight runs a start and just getting hammered. Yep. Uh, um, <laughs> well, so let, let's start with this. Um, the guys that I'm not worried about right now, there, I should say, only one guy I'm worried about, and that's Louis Varlin. Pablo's going to be fine. Pa Pablo, Pablo pitched a great game last yeah. time. Yep. One home run, fine. He should have finished the seventh inning, too. But we took him out in the sixth inning. Um, Joe Ryan's been great. He, oh, he, by the way, the he's the only one that – and who? Yep. Who would, yeah, okay, all right, all right, because he's been the most consistent guy on the rotation. Yep. Didn't even Bailey start the playoffs last year. Okay, because Louis Varlin did. Right, go ahead. Bailey Bailey had a uh I think his second start was actually really good, a good bounce back start. Um the sheriff, I, I think he gets it because he's Mr. Country. Uh I don't know. It just okay. popped up. First of all, I think it's a badass nickname, but if, I, I don't know where yeah, he got it. But you know. um Chris Paddock is someone I'm actually excited about. I, I think this first month has been iffy. But I, I, I'm excited to see. He's got great stuff. He's got great stuff. All right. I think he can. I think he can do well. Um, Louis Varlin and I said, I, I had said it multiple times on this show. I was excited to see him in a starting role, but at the same time, I was. I always said I think he's so much better out of the bullpen because this guy has never been proven outside of AAA. He, he, when we call him up, everyone just. I don't understand where the the hype around Louis Varlin as a starter came from because every time he came up to start a game, it was never that pretty. His right. ERA is over five basically every year. Um, well, now it's looks great. Seven, I looks think. great out of the pen. I, I don't know that the the focus for five six innings is there for this guy. He, I know right. he's still young, but I think when you can tell him, hey, give him your best stuff for one maybe two innings. I, I think it'll be like, I mean, he can throw a hundred, like let him just right. rear okay. back and give it to him. So that, does that mean that you're going to go with the law firm as your, as your fifth starter then? I would I okay. reward the guy for, for shoving for one game when no one right. else really has. And I get it. His triple A numbers aren't well, 
he had one bad start in AAA where they just let him let him pitch and he gave up eight runs. Right. But when you come up here and you you give a struggling team that good of a start, I think you need to let him let him go. Just let him pitch more. Um, and I think you're going to see David Festa, who's one of the top uh, top arms we have. He's pitching really well in AAA because um, if we keep struggling, he's going to have to get some runs. <laughs> But but that's the point that that I would that I think we made earlier, um, in earlier podcasts is that you you didn't okay well let's let's move on then unless you have anything else more about the starting rotation because right now I mean they're not giving us a chance to win games especially with no bats well no one it's and it's it's frustrating because look you had what thirty million dollars you left on the table and wouldn't go get. A Montgomery, um, a, a why can't I think of the other the other guys that were out Blake there? Blake Snell, Blake Snell, yeah. No. The, these guys that it, it, even if they struggled, I still would have at least enjoyed that we went out and spent the money. Yep. For a guy that was supposed yep. to be good, you know what I mean. If he struggled, fine. I I don't know that I would have blamed the front office for it. You know what I mean? Because they actually went out and spent the money. Right. So it's just, it, it pisses everyone off that you did nothing and you sat on your hands and just wanted to pocket an extra $30 yep. million. Yep. And, and that brings me to the, the, the second prediction. I was not pleased with, with the corner outfield positions. And, and if you remember in a previous podcast, I said, you're putting your 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 eggs in in some young guys' baskets, all right. And and whether it's starting pitching or certain position players, and you better be damn sure that they are ready or up for the task. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Okay. So what happens? Um, Matt Walner's already down in St. Paul. Okay. I think he got one hit the whole season so far. Right. Couple. Ab- absolutely clueless. Okay, which brings you back to the Trevor Larnick experience, which we all know about that. Oh, well, if he's healthy, you just never know. No, Trevor Larnick is not going to get you any anywhere. I, you, you'd almost say you'd rather have Max Kepler out there, but, but you wouldn't. So right now, you're pretty much screwed when it comes to your out, outfield position because that means Manuel Margot is going to, and oh, by the way, and, and, you know, I didn't want to get to this quite yet, but just for the record, Margot is batting 184 right now. But we'll get to batting averages in a second. But but here's the deal. Max Kepler is, you know, yeah, great. Let's have a revival, Max, when you get back off the injured list. But I don't know if I see that, see that coming down the pike. You have nobody in left. Because it's going to be a platoon between Larnick, Margot, and I get, I'm get i guessing Matt Walner will be back up here again, right? So what what do you do? And then the probably the funniest thing that I heard was ESPN reported just yesterday, top Minnesota twin on the trade block, Max Kepler. You show me a team that's fucking interested in Max Kepler, and I will show you a losing team. Maybe the Washington Nationals. Maybe we can reunite Gallo and Max Kepler. Great. I, if you can get a prospect for Max Kepler right now, go for it. Go for it. Um, yeah. The one guy out of this that in no way, shape, or form should be sent down to AAA, can you guess? Well, I, I hope you're not going to say ever Julian because. No, well, no, I was going to say Austin Martin. Oh no, yeah, Austin Martin's the only thing. He's yeah. one of the only reasons I tune in is to watch his at bats and watch him play in the outfield right now. Um, and I don't get how you can have a 24 year old rookie come up to the plate or and and come up to the league and put together these at bats and no one says holy shit, the rookie yeah. is out doing like. The guy's hitting like 250, and I still like 250 is not a a accurate representation of what base what kind of baseball he has played. No, for because he's so he's been getting clutch hits, and he's the only one that I go. We might got a shot at actually scoring a run here if he's at at the plate. I agree wholeheartedly with you on it. I forgot about bringing Austin Martin up. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'll give you that one. Remember, Walner did tear it up last year when he when he first got here. And he's a uh, he, like I said, I I think I think I'd mentioned it of sending Walner down just to get his his footing back. And yeah, it looked clueless. Um, they sent him to AAA. I think his first game he went two for four and had a monster blast center field. So. Um, if he can figure it out down there and, and, and come up and, and at least impact it a little better uh, on the, on the field, I think that would be, it would go dividends because obviously no one can, can hit. And, and even if Correa comes back, I don't, I don't know. I guess he was hitting not, not too bad actually. Well, but. he was hitting pretty, hitting the ball pretty well, but right now, because it is on both sides of the ball, it, it, it's the pitching and obviously the hitting, um, that they just, I mean, thank God we got the Chicago White Sox in our division to make us look at least not that bad. All right. But, um, I, I, I gotta tell you, man, I, it is only a month, but you're, you know, you're already talking about, well, if we can get a prospect for him and then we're only in April right now, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's, it's, it's sad to think that if we're already talking this way in April, what it's going to be like when, when we get to July or August. And here's the thing, you know, we, injuries have played a, a really bad part in all of this, except you can't say because Royce is out, he can only hit so many home runs per game, right? Carlos uh, hitting the ball well, defensively great, but you can't expect one or two guys to say that's that's the entire reason because it's so bad on on so many fronts right now. And and I think that we, you could have assumed, and it, it happens all the time. And with the amount of rookies that we relied on last year, there was going to be some regression. There, there's always a sophomore regression for the most part. There's yeah. some cases where there's not, um, but it looks bad. And and quite honestly. I, I just I don't understand it. if this continues into May. I don't know how Popkins and and uh, what Rudy Hernandez I think is the assistant hitting coach. They need to lose their jobs because there's obviously no preparation in 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 anything. I mean they look clueless. You can't score one run and win the game. Right. Yep. Yep. And and let me let me just throw this out there um, because. In addition to all these things, now here is the the one thing that I harped on um, that they they just didn't do anything to piggyback on last year's team at all. And in fact, you know, you say like, well, okay, there was addition by subtraction, except it was subtraction by subtraction. They never filled any of those pieces. They might get lucky, like you say, with a guy like Austin Martin, but they never filled anything. And to me, in, in my opinion, uh, La Pola Nostra, okay, they're, they're laughing right now because they, they all the way to the bank. Because they said we're not going to do anything to make this team better. They got rid of some folks and they didn't put any pieces in play there. Okay. And what I mean by that, let, let's just talk about this for a second. You got you got Edward Julian, who's batting 175, but you can't do anything with him because he's the only one that can hit the ball out of the park right now. Okay. You've got Willie Castro batting 122, Margot 184, Vasquez 133, Walner was batting 80, 080, Byron Buxton 193, Kepler 050 at the time of it that he got hurt, Carlos Santana 135, and Kyle Farmer. 097. Now I know you don't put anything in batting averages anymore, but what I'm saying on that is you didn't, at least offensively, you didn't fill in any, any missing spots when it comes to that. Okay. And, and by the way, Michael Taylor is batting 298 with six RBIs and eight runs scored. Polanco 182, but he's got three home runs and eight RBIs. Okay, and so like I say, La Pola Nostra just insulting you by telling you that we were not going to make this team any better. And guess what? They didn't. 
And, and it is proven. And one of the things I bring up Kyle Farmer, because I don't understand it. I read an article today that said even Kyle Farmer was surprised that they brought him back because it was like $6 million for doing nothing. But Fucking fuck a game up by missing a missing a ball in the infield and and batting 097. Now I like Kyle Farney, a great guy, nice guy, but he's not helping this team out at all. I'm not saying Polanco should have been re-signed. I'm not, maybe I'm saying Michael A. Taylor should have been, but I've I've just given you uh 14 RBIs by by former twins that I think. Wait, wait a minute. Was it? Yeah, fourteen RBIs by two former Twins, and I isn't that more than what the Twins have all year? Well, it's funny because they they did a, a list of who scored the most runs at each ballpark this year, and there's only two teams that a different team has scored more runs at their own ballpark, yeah. and it was the Twins and the A's. Okay, two two shitty teams. Yeah, um, you should automatically have more runs scored at your home stadium than another, another team. I get it. It's only been six now when you're only, you only have two hits in a game. Exactly. And, and I, I have some optimism that it's going to get going. When you look at a Ryan Jeffers who started slow, but now has been picking it up. Wow. Alex Kirloff has, has looked really nice, which is really good to see from, from his struggles in the past. But a guy like Carlos Santana, who who who, now traditionally wah, wah, always sucks wah, wah. in April. Yep, but we'll, we'll see. I again, I'm not. You have ready. to play him every day because there's nobody else there. I know, and and well, and let to your point, injuries have not helped us yet. Brooks Lee would be on this team right now, right? With you know, without injuries, I think Emmanuel Rod Rodriguez is killing it in double a i think he needs to see some triple a time if not soon some mlb time uh especially if kepler and and, and larnick and walner are gonna suck um well no, but wait i got one more for you I, we haven't even touched upon yet i was just gonna say i'm not i'm not it, it's frustrating but i'm not 16 games in i'm not ready to right. say i know this team is done um especially with the easier schedule coming up when we hit May, I think that's when I'll get a little more worried. Um, but if this is the, you know, I said it last year too, because believe it or not, or remember it or not, this team went through this exact same thing last year. Right. Um, so. But you had a better. Every team's going to go, every, every team's going to go through a rough stretch. And if they get it out of the way now, great. You know, it, it's, that's my optimism piece, I think. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the last one that I wanted to bring up was, um, Byron Buxton's batting 193 and he looks like the same guy at the plate that he was last year, except for the fact that he could pull the ball over the fence every once in a while when he was hurt, but he looks like the exact same guy at the plate and everyone knows Give him whatever you want on the first pitch because I guess he's going to swing at whatever you throw him on the very first pitch. But he looks lost at the plate as well. I think he'll get it going. I think what's not to be overlooked is that, or we should at least celebrate that he's 16 games in and he's made some phenomenal plays and has not gotten hurt. So you take what you can get, I guess. Okay, well, my final my – final then prediction that that we had made about this you know I, I brought up the corner outfielders i brought up the the starting rotation but here's what i said if if la pola nostra uh is committed to what this team is going to look like this year if it continues if they have a, a month of may just like they had in april target field is going to be a ghost town by june it is I know my people very well. Okay. I do. And I'm not saying and it ain't going to be Johnny Voss because we, if we win 50 games this year, I'm still going to be at target field a majority of those games. But we do know that ain't going to be a lot of people going out to the ballpark to watch this team play. And once again, 
Minnesota fans, pound the fucking table because you should not be okay with this. All right. They're already doing Minnesota Timberwolves expansion stuff with, hey, come see the New York Yankees and Aaron Judge. We are well past trying to entice people to come to the ballpark based on who your fucking opponent is. Okay. And, and so you should not be okay with this. And I'm not saying that I have the answer. Like my, my dad, Vern Voss would say, well, you know what? If everyone just stops going, no, I, in general, all the way, they stop going, not just to Vikings games, but the NFL, then they'll have to change something. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay. But what I am encouraging Minnesota fans to do is pound the table and say, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not okay with this. That, that to me, and, you know, not going to the ballpark isn't going to be enough. Actually being vocal about it and maybe bringing a sign like a La Pola Nostra sign that says, you fucked us. I, I'm tired of it. I think the sad thing about Joe Polad is he doesn't give a shit. No. And you look, Joe Pol Polad, I know you're listening. Um, but <laughs> fuck you. Yeah, right. Fuck you. Like, I, I, wow. And I hope Pops isn't watching now, uh, after, after that. But I agree with you. I agree with you because it shouldn't be like that. And we didn't even get into the Glenn Taylor deal, you know, and, and that's going to have to be a podcast for later. Uh, but, but I agree, man. The owners just want us to bend over when you should not. Ever, ever, ever look at some of these new owners coming in. I mean, the Baltimore Orioles are, are a big one. They, they got a new ownership group that now first year. So we see what happens. But um, I believe technically Joe Polad took over the team two years ago. I think when he started, he jumped into this role. Um, you should not be allowed to own a team like this. I like I understand the the money aspect, but but. Holy shit. I mean, you own a team to win a championship and yes, you have a good group of guys out in the field, but the whole, the whole idea of spend money to make money. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that applies here. Spend money to win a championship. Um, and, and because, that's, and do you think it's because they have so many spoons in, in so many different pots that they just don't get, I mean, that's why I referred to them as I did, you know, the mafia, because, what they're in movies and they're in car dealerships and all this. And so, I mean, is the Minnesota twins, which are, are paying their bills by the way, as well. Is that just a hobby? You, you know what I mean? Or are you really in it to want to bring more championships to Minnesota? I think there is out of all sports ownership groups, I think about 5% actually care about winning a championship. I think 95% wow. don't give a shit and only care about the money. I get it. Money talks. And this is so lucrative, but I think 95% don't give a shit. So you're saying, okay, like, cause you know, that that's, that's a, a bold statement because you got teams like the Dodgers and the angels and uh, the New York Mets and the Yankees. You said, Spending money. I mean, they they do, I think, spend money to try to put the best team. It doesn't always work that way. But, I mean, I, I would say that maybe it's higher than 5% as far as owners wanting to win uh, world championships because there are a lot of teams that put a lot of money on the table because they think that's going to help their team win win a, a World Series. Yeah, I think I think baseball is a little different when you can, can when you can throw more money than other sports, you know, with the right. with how the caps and work and everything. But I mean, it, like first of all, you mentioned the Angels. Art Moreno don't give a shit. He doesn't give a <laughs> shit. Um, some of these guys. I mean, yes, there's a couple teams out there. Five percent might be too low, but um, I think there is a a vast majority of owners that this is a business move money move and i yes it's a business i get it um but i think the end goal is profit over championship um All right yes and so, but, but don't you think that <clears throat> well i'll ask you this 
what what do you think May Twins baseball looks like? The month of May. The month of May, I think this team finishes thirteen and fifteen to end this end the the month of April. Okay. Um, ideally, you want to be fifteen and fifteen. I think with the way I looked at the schedule, um, but I think they go thirteen and fifteen. Um, I think they start off the first week of May a little slow, but I think traditionally Twins baseball is pretty good in May, no matter what kind of team it is. I think they end up, I mean, I think they have a winning record by the end of May. Okay. All right. Uh, because I just don't want to, because I, you know, I was, I was listening to uh, a local radio show and they were talking about, um, I believe it was uh, 18 years to the day um today that the the this is before your time but the, the we needed to tank a game the Timberwolves needed to take a game and Mark Madsen took like seven three pointers uh against Memphis ended up losing in overtime but it was um just this terrible debacle to watch like it, like you couldn't you couldn't be proud of being an NBA team or watching the NBA when you saw how badly they tried to lose this game. Um, and then that just ushered in like a decade of bad basketball forever in Minnesota. Okay. And I've lived through decades of twins baseball where it's been that bad, but I mean, April has given me like those little like acid flashbacks of going, God, I remember what it was like in, in the, the mid nineties, the late nineties with this team. And I, I don't want it to be like that where the players are like, well, we won, we finally won a playoff series. So now we can go at least 10 years and, and be at the bottom or be a, a seller dweller. And it's not really going to matter because I'm still getting paid, you know, but who's the ones that, that hurt in this whole equation is the ones that actually are, are paying those bills by coming to see your team because we care so much about it. You know what I mean? And I don't want to see this like snowball effect where suddenly the twins are like, eh, we're, we just, we really don't care about who we're going to bring in and who we're going to match and, and how we're going to remember last year was only a given because there were not a lot of very good teams in the central. All right. And, and so to be a really good team, you're going to have to maintain a competitive level. And, and I'm not seeing it this year, right? At least right now. Definitely not right now. Um, but like I said, I, I still got some optimism left in the tank. I think may, well, right. You can't hopefully would yes, look a little better. Talking about an eight, an eight month season. You know what I mean? So you, you can't, and I'm, I'm not trying to be, anyway, I'm saying pound the fucking table, Minnesota fans. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else about baseball? Final thing. I did have to bring this up because it's, it's probably a little before your time. Um, but I was just curious about it. Uh, the passing of OJ Simpson. Um, I don't know if that's a big deal for a guy your age. Um, he was one of the best running backs of all, all time. Then obviously you're aware of, you know, the, the lean years, I guess. Um, I, I just wanted to make one comment, like guy to me, you know, like I, I don't ever celebrate people getting hurt or dying, whether they're a piece of shit or not. I saw Caitlin Jennings Jenner, I think came out and said good riddance or something like that. Come on, be classy about it. It's still a human being who is, and, you know, by all accounts, some people thought he had a hand in two other people not being around. I understand that. But have some class to it. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm an OJ fan. Um, I have my own opinions about what, a, what kind of human being I think he was. But I just, you know, I didn't celebrate Aaron Rodgers getting hurt. I don't celebrate somebody dying. Not that I'm comparing those two things, but you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. Um, OJ, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a, a, I don't have a huge connection with the whole OJ thing. I mean, growing up, you know, you heard about it. Um, I, I, 
it, it's not like it hit me. I'm like, oh man, OJ died. You know what I mean? But, yeah. Um, I don't know. I I wasn't here or there uh, on it. Um, so I really just it, it wasn't huge for me. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know. I guess that's my question. Like folks your age, I mean, that was the biggest story for like a decade, you know what I mean? And, and still resounds in this day. And I remember exactly where I was. I was playing Wisconsin Synod church league softball down in Burnsville on a Friday night and came back with my girlfriend. We were going to watch, I think we were going to watch, um, Oh, there was a lot of stuff going on that weekend, man. Like, um, uh, but, uh, Oh, we we're going to watch the NBA finals. And we saw the, you know, the, the white Bronco chase, and I thought he was going to get shot on live TV. And it, it made a huge impact on me. Like my 18 year old girlfriend's going, what, what, why, why is this a big deal? And I'm like, you don't understand. This is, this is like the face of the NFL for many years. He was this incredible football player. Um, a guy that your uncle actually saw in a game. He didn't play because there was a death in the family. He, uh, but he was with the San Francisco 49ers and I was with my parents at the old Metropolitan Stadium. I still have the program. I can prove this, but he chose not to play. He was in uniform, but said, anyways, it was such a big deal because we had never seen a celebrity of that status be involved in something like this. And then, you know, I'm not going to judge because I, I don't know the guy, but you know, as one of the jurors said, no, we got him uh, innocent uh, because that was payback for Rodney King. You know, I mean, like th there was a lot of stuff about that whole thing. Anyways, uh, I was just curious if, if young folks like you, if you guys had done any uh, brushing up or like done any studying on this because it is such an incredible story. It, I mean, you had a couple of people. I think it was more, it was a lot of 50, 50 of people that were just like, uh, eh, screw that guy. He did it. And some people, Oh no, no, he didn't do it. Stuff like that. Um, but, but <laughs> you know, it, it didn't really impact us. So that that's, I think that's why it, it just wasn't a huge, huge thing for us. I think if you, if all of a sudden it was, uh, I think LeBron James is too big of a, but you know, if it was, if it was a, a, a guy that, that maybe our generation relates to a little more, uh, it would have been a, a, a bigger thing for sure. But. Okay. All right. I, I was just kidding because as a student of the game that I, I think that you are, I mean, there, there are many things that I latched on to that. I didn't live through in the fifties and the sixties that were just passed on to me by my parents or, you know, by, by whatever, just finding it, organically, I guess. And, and so I was just, just curious about it, but you know, I guess my lesson on this is, you know, stay classy, San Diego about, about certain things, you know, like, yeah, right? well, I don't want anyone to die. Right. Like, unless you're, it, it's yeah. Because like, I think there's a difference of, Oh, OJ died and Oh, like Osama bin Laden died. You know what I mean? Correct. But yeah. I hear, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's about as, I guess, as thick into politics that we can get on this, even though I had some zingers that I don't know if anybody caught. Uh, if not, do your homework because I am a teacher. Uh, Noah, you got anything going? I know we went pretty long tonight, but we, we got a night of baseball or weekend of baseball and basketball coming up but anything uh you want to want to touch upon as as we head out no oh, go wolves go wolves man wolves in five how about that let's do it all right buddy all right well thank you friends for uh tuning in we plan on being back very very soon hopefully the next time we uh we do any kind of recording the wolves are up one game to zero uh, i'll put that on noah so uh, for our good friend, uh, Noah Storzinger, I'm Johnny Boss. You've been watching the Show to Be Named Later podcast. We'll see you next time.